Today we're beginning a new series, one that is called Leading While Stuck in the Home. We're going to go verse by verse through the book of Titus, and my hope is that we will know the Lord better through the study and feel more equipped to be ambassadors for Christ, disciple makers, and be the church of the living God. Just so you know, I'm standing outside in my backyard. I'm holding my iPad as I read a bunch of my notes. I'm going to try to look at you, but I'm also going to look at this. Kids are going to play in the background, so just get used to it. I want to talk about, as we're studying the book of Titus, I want to read the first four verses to you. There'll be slides up on the video, but I want to read it to you real quick because I want us to look at what we're going to study today. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, he is brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So Titus is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. It is known as one of his pastor letters. He also wrote two letters to another elder pastor named Timothy who was a friend of his and was a young man. And there is some similar content in the two letters to Timothy as there are in this letter to Titus. Titus is a young pastor who's leading a church in Crete. It's an island on the Mediterranean Sea that was about 160 miles long, 35 miles wide. It was in close proximity to churches like Corinth and Galatia, where Paul had helped begin other churches there. And Paul was writing to Titus to not only equip him, but to hand over some of Paul's apostolic authority by writing this letter to Titus, who was pastoring in Crete a very new, young, and we'd say immature church community. This church already had false teachers. It had Judaizers coming to teach things that were not biblically sound. Judaizers, you may remember, are a group of people that believed in Jesus, but believed in order to come to Christ, you first had to go through Jewish customs, which for every male would mean being circumcised. And the expectation of everyone was that they would keep to the dietary laws of the Jewish religion. So Paul is going to combat this, not just by reminding Titus of the gospel, which he does, but by flexing his apostolic right to encourage and equip Titus to walk in the power of the Spirit and the authority of Paul's apostolic ministry. With the young church, Titus probably didn't have to deal with a lot of, well, we do this because we've always done it this way. But there probably were a lot of things they just didn't know how to do. And with their immaturity, they also were influenced by a wide array of false teaching as Paul warned Timothy in his letters to him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he puts it this way, For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And for Titus and this church in Crete, this was happening in real time. It was happening to them already. So we read this letter from Paul that is sent to this young pastor to validate Titus's ministry and his authority as a pastor and elder in this new church on this somewhat large island. We'll see in chapter one that Paul is going to point out the character and the conduct of leaders that Titus should be appointing as leaders in the church. Then in chapter two, we're gonna see Paul speaking of what the conduct and character of the members of the church in Crete ought to be. Then in chapter three, we'll see Paul speak about the character and conduct that the world needs to see from the church in Crete as a whole. Let's begin in verse one, where Paul will begin showing his credentials to those who are in Crete by way of Titus. He says this in verse one, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of that truth that leads to godliness. Okay, I'm gonna do my best not to spend the entire sermon on just this verse, but spoiler, I probably will. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I don't know if there are better credentials than what Paul just offered to the church in Crete through Titus. Paul, the man who was up, the, I'm sorry, the man who was up until chapter nine of the book of Acts was only seen as an enemy to Christianity. In fact, in chapter 7, it says this in verse 57, it says, At this, they covered their ears and were yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, him being Stephen, who was preaching the gospel to a lot of these Israel or Jewish onlookers. Verse 58, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. 
Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Remember that. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And then verse 1 of chapter 8, and Saul approved of their killing him. Saul ends up becoming Paul. Saul was his Jewish name, and he starts to follow Jesus later on, which we're about to talk about. But Saul changed his name to Paul. And so this is what it says. Saul, this Pharisee, this young and up and coming uh, Pharisee who is up against all things Jesus, runs into Jesus in the book of Acts in chapter 9. And Jesus says to Paul, after Jesus is resurrected from the dead and shown himself to Paul, he says in chapter 9, verse 4, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. Saul, that would be renamed Paul, who first attempts to stop the Christian movement, which is known as the Way, eventually joins the Way of making known that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because he's seen him resurrected. He's physically come in contact with Jesus after he's died on a cross, risen from the dead, and for the first time ever, he actually obeys the Lord for the right reasons when he goes into town and he speaks to a guy named Ananias. Ananias has spoken to the Lord in a vision, and the Lord has told Ananias to pray over Paul or Saul, and Saul will be used to preach amongst the nations to the Gentiles. Then in Galatians chapter 1, after Paul has become an apostle of Jesus, after he's met Jesus alive, after he died, he writes this in chapter 1 as he's writing to the church in Galatia. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that I'm writing you, what I'm writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Cy Cyria and Sicilia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praise God because of me. Paul is not only a, servants of God, or a servant of God, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, but is one of the most unlikely followers of Jesus. Because he wasn't just a non-believer, he was a zealous opponent against the cause of Christ. And yet God used him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And as a servant of God's, Paul understood he was bought at a price and his response was to offer his life to God. I know in America we think servanthood or slavery as something that is done against our will, but in Christ, serving him becomes our will as we realize God's sacrifice, we realize his love, we realize God's beauty. We can't help but want things to, we can't help but want to do things for him, to bring glory to him. Church of the Valley, I am so encouraged by what I'm hearing from many of you where you're concerned about others in this community. You're praying for others. You're offering to get help of groceries for others and find out the needs of other people that are within the community. When we serve one another, we're serving Christ because we do it out of a grace-driven effort. We do it out of spirit-led obedience. And Paul, a servant of God's and an apostle of Jesus Christ, We've been studying the middle of the book of John. We've been in chapters 13, 14, 15 lately. We're supposed to jump into 16. And we've been reading about Jesus with his disciples. We've been reading about him washing their feet, sharing a meal, Jesus dismissing Judas so Judas can fulfill his plan of betraying Jesus. We've witnessed Jesus speaking to his disciples, but a select few, in fact, 11, that would become his apostles, men that he specifically appointed to start and equip the church of Jesus Christ. And it's documented in the book of Acts as these men are dominated by the Holy Spirit. But these were 11 
plus Matthias that would become an apostle at the end of Acts chapter 1, and, they, and he replaces Judas. These apostles were not just anyone, not just disciples. They were specific men who had been with Jesus since the beginning of his earthly ministry and walked with him and had seen him perform miracles. They'd seen him preach the kingdom of God. They had been witnesses to his physical resurrection. Paul was not with Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, but was chosen by God in, the, in Acts chapter 9 to be a tool of the Lord's to make known the gospel to the Gentiles. And as Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Then he, being Jesus, appeared to James, that's Jesus' brother, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul was abnormally born. He was not around for what the other apostles experienced because he persecuted the church, except he did meet Jesus alive after he died on the road to Damascus. But Paul knew everything he was and did was not because of his great effort, which he could brag about, but about the Lord working through him. So this is a lot of Paul, and this is a lot about what Paul has done, but we do not worship Paul, church. We do not treat Paul as more important than the writings or the actions of any of the other apostles. But what we see is that Paul was extending authority from the Lord to then offer his authority and his approval to Titus, this young pastor in Crete. So Titus chapter 1 verse 1, the second part of it, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So why was Paul a servant of God's and an apostle of Jesus Christ? To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to something and it leads to godliness. Paul an apostle, one who was set apart by God to preach and teach, to further the gospel, to plant churches and to equip and anoint elders was part of the plan of God's to further the faith of the elect. Now I know the word elect can be polarizing, and we'll get to it, but let's not skip over the term furthering of faith, or according to their faith in some translations, or in ESV, for the sake of their faith. Paul aligns his rank as an apostle with God's people's faith. I would contend that he's pointing out that he knows that he doesn't save people, but he and all of the apostles the sent ones, as they're known, are tools so people can have faith. And they, like the prophets of old, were used to write the word of God as they were led by the Holy Spirit to pen the words in the New Testament. When you hear apostles in scripture, I want you to think of people who were used to write the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 said, Build on the foundation of the apostles, New Testament, and the prophets, Old Testament, with Christ Jesus himself, as the chief cornerstone. All of us have been stationary as we've been at home. We've had more time on our hands in theory. Parents who are homeschooling are like, uh, no pastor, we're actually learning math again and we have no time. But for the rest of us, we've had more time to be in God's word. To not list, not to spend all our time just hanging out in traffic, but to be in God's very words and digest them, to meditate on them, to contemplate how to apply them in our current quarantine lives. This furthers our faith. And Paul understood that he was part of God's plan to build up Jesus's church, to further the faith of God's elect. Okay, let's go. Because this term, this theology, it makes people struggle and I understand. I struggle with the idea that God, shudder, predestines, that he predetermines salvation, that he chooses us, that we don't choose him, that he accepts us, it's not the other way around. This seems to impede what we want to believe because we all want to believe that God gives us free will. Because we think that if we don't have free will, if God elects, if he predestines, then we have not only no choice, but that we're robots. Now there's a tension. We're not robots. We have the ability to pick up a pen and to drop that pen anytime that we want. But salvation, 
the idea of someone coming to be in relationship with God, to no longer be destined apart from God for eternity. Salvation, according to the word of God, belongs to the Lord. It's not something we can do anything to attain, nor is it something we want to choose without God actually giving us the want to choose him. So as we've studied before in John 15, 16, we studied this just about a month back, Jesus says, you did not choose me, John 15, 16, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Now I can hear the argument right now, especially as we studied this passage and made very clear that he was saying this to the apostles. So maybe he just chose the apostles is the argument. Well, there is a rule that we use at Church of the Valley all the time as we allow scripture to interpret scripture. And we take this seriously. So let's see what it says in Romans chapter nine, verse 15 and 16. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and he has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and who has brought life and immor immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And then lastly, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, Paul writes, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. There are plenty of other passages that allude to or blatantly talk about God being the one who not only chooses but predetermines. And I know we don't like this. I think it's okay to not understand this or possibly to not even like it necessarily. There are plenty of other passages that allude or blatantly talk about God being the one who not only chooses us but predetermines our salvation. And I think it's okay to not understand God predestining us to salvation. But it isn't okay to say that God cannot do that. Look at it this way. You didn't clean yourself up to come to Jesus. Jesus met you right where you were. You didn't strive or try really hard to get him or get his attention. He saw you before you saw him and he rescued you. While you were drowning in the quicksand of your sin, God in his mercy and grace pulled you out without any help of yourself, your effort, or your will. It's okay to not understand how God saved you, but it's not okay to think that you somehow could save yourself. Because, there, because that gospel, that's not a real gospel. See, the gospel isn't about you. It's about Jesus and putting on display how good he is to save wretches like us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Charles Spurgeon said it so well. I believe that nothing happens apart from divine determination and decree. We shall never be able to escape from the doctrine of divine predestination, the doctrine that God has foreordained certain people unto eternal life. Okay, so can we take a breath? Who's turned off the video so far? I guess we won't know because you've turned it off. Last part of verse one, and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Those who know Christ get to know him better over time. They read the word, they meditate on it, they obey it and it leads to godliness. Those who know him grow to look more like him. That's what happens. For the grace of God, Titus two verses 11 through 12, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. 
Godliness is like Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness is a synonym for sanctification. As we are dominated by the Spirit and obey God's word for the right reasons, we, at- we tend to become more godly, more Christ-like. And the Spirit doesn't lead us alongside our flesh. The Spirit is in conflict with our flesh and leads us towards the God who tells us to do the things that he'd have us to do. See, the fight of our flesh and God's spirit is real. Once we've been adopted by God and sealed with his spirit, we still have a will of our own that we constantly want to fight against God and his commands because we want to do things in the flesh. See, our flesh and our will, it wants pleasure. But the spirit of God wants glory to go to God. And let's be honest, we often choose the former because the latter goes against our sin nature. But as we say all the time, but God. The Spirit can dominate us. The Spirit can use us. The Spirit can lead us to apply the Word of God. But I'm so glad that even though I sin more than I think I obey, I hope that's not just me, God doesn't change my status of being His Son and a servant of the God Most High. So maybe you're struggling with godliness. Maybe you wonder if God even chose you. Please don't look at your works as your evidence. Because for everything you've done that you may think has been led by the Spirit, you can come up with 10 things that you did in the flesh. Let's not create a ledger with God or assume that God will grade on a curve. Let's look to Jesus and bow our heads and bow our wills and trust that he's got us. Not because we first loved him, but because he first loved us. Verse 2. in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. So this hope that can be found in Jesus, that salvation is available for every person who by faith repents and turns to Jesus was promised before the beginning of time. This was not a new plan. Jesus has always been the plan and God knew that the world left to themselves would need God to take on the flesh and live among us living as we should, dying as we were sentenced, and rising from the dead as validation that his complete power was over sin and death. Verse 3, And which now, at his appointed season, he is brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Again, God knew and had a plan before the beginning of time and chose to reveal the fulfillment of his plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. And he appointed Paul and all the other apostles to preach and let it be known that Jesus is Lord. Verse 4, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. My wife said to me earlier while I was writing the sermon that Pastor Mike and I always get so excited about the salutations in Scripture. I'm not sure if she was making fun of us or not, but totally guilty. Paul, as he begins this letter, does it with such a rich and deep explanation of why God has appointed him as an apostle and how that authority that comes with his office is what Titus is pastoring and shepherding under. All handed down under under the one that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to in Jesus Christ. I chose the book of Titus because the book is about the character and conduct in the church, in homes, in leadership, as a member of a community, and as light in a dark world. Listen, I know the idea of God choosing and or electing people to salvation may seem foreign. It may even conflict with how you want to see God. But listen, we don't get to make up a God we want. We get to worship the God who revealed himself to the world in the person and work of Jesus Christ and documented himself in scripture. But knowing that salvation belongs to the Lord and that he's the only one who can give it to anyone as a gift is like a nice warm blanket for my soul. Because yet again, it reminds me that he is God, I am not, and I need him. So I want to give us some applications. If you're a parent and you want to see your offspring, your children, those closest to you, know Jesus Christ, as the great theologian MC Hammer once said, we got to pray just to make it today. We need to be examples to our children. We want them to follow our example if we're trusting in following Jesus, but we have to pray for them.
I can't save my children, only God can. No matter how consistent I am in the home, no matter how many Bible studies I attend or lead, that doesn't save my children, God does. So we pray, and we pray not to force our will upon him or treat God like a magic eight ball, but we pray to get in line with his will and look at what the word says about praying. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul urges Timothy, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live in peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So pray for all people. But I know that there is nothing more in this world that I desire that God would rescue, save, adopt, choose, and elect all four of my own personal children to salvation. And I bet for some of you that is exactly what your parents wanted for you. And some of our parents prayed for us, and look at us now. So listen, you can put kindling around your children spiritually by loving them and giving them a great example and studying the word with them, but it is only God who sparks the fire. So pray and ask God to do so. Church of the Valley family, as one of your pastors and one of the elders in this church, I wanna remind you how much you matter to God. He didn't choose you and change you to look more like his son progressively so you would live an easier life or have more fun. He chose you so that you could know the beauty and the majesty that is in our triune God represented and manifested in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. He elected you to salvation so you could make much of his name without taking any credit for his work, but that he would work through you. So how are we going to live as adopted sons and daughters of the God Most High as God's own possession set apart to make much of his name while we're quarantined and stationary? This week's been weird, but honestly, this week's been great. I spent more time with my family this week than I ever have outside of a vacation. And at the same time, I've spent more time on the phone. I've done more Zoom calls, more FaceTime, more email corresponding with many of you and studying the word with you and laughing and crying with many of you than I normally do in a given week. I've ran more consistently this week than I ever have. There are plenty of ways this circumstance could get us down. Well, let's not let it. Because God knows all about what is happening, what will happen. He is good and because of his grace, we're with him and we're his. No matter if we're in our homes or out and about in what used to feel like normal life. If I can give you an application this week, it's simply to be thankful of the God who knows every hair on your head, the same God who knows every evil thought in your minds, every deed that you've ever done, even when you would want glory for yourself, still sent his son to live the life that you and I cannot live, die the death, that you and I ought to die, and physically rose from the dead, securing our salvation for any and every person who would turn to him. If you haven't made a commitment to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to do so. Let me know. I or many of our leaders, elders, staff, would love to walk with you through this and what it means to become a committed follower of Jesus. If you already have, and this situation is bringing you worry or fear or frustration because of quarantine, we have an entire prayer team and really a community that would be delighted to talk with you and pray over you. So just let us know. Church family, let's grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Not because we can do it on our own, but because God with us can. And he's done the heavy lifting by giving us his spirit, his word, his son, and his heart to love him and to love others.